Well, Dr. Rankin, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, well, my pleasure. Today on this episode of Reconnections and Updates, it's what we're calling the program now, this is where we have a chance to go back and visit with people that were in past documentaries and past projects that have meant a lot to us here in the College of Education. And Dr. Rankin here was with us in A Long Road, which was talking about some of the history of early um, black faculty, students, and alumni that were here uh, kind of from the start of Kansas State University's history, but also moving forward. And so, Dr. Rankin, thank you so much for being here with us. Yes, sir. So, uh, it's been, I can't believe it's been like a year and a half since we did A Long Road, and probably almost two years since you had your first conversation with us about that. Right. So, what was your memories of sitting down uh, with Tawny and Albert that day of talking about some of their history? Well, it was an interesting experience from the standpoint it made me relive certain things that I really suppressed. And uh, it was kind of therapeutic. It was uh, enlightening. And it was good to get to talk about it again. Didn't realize I'd done so many things. It helps you've been around for a while. So. <laughs> yeah, it pr proves I'm alive. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, when I talk to people of all ages, it seems like everyone's got a story to tell. And... Um, Depending on where you come from, how far you've moved, everyone's got some interesting parts of life that we just haven't explored yet. So for me, that was a very uh, fun part of this project was being able to listen to these stories again and again, and then hopefully, you know, extract those and do some justice with the storytelling there. Okay. You know, the one thing we really kind of left off is we told your history of what happened as a young man growing up in Winfield, Kansas. The part we want to kind of hear about today is what happened to you from the time you left Winfield, Kansas, and got into your career. So why don't we pick off with... Uh, with that part, what happened to you when you graduated from high school? Well, like most young African-American males, you're trying to figure out what you can do. And so I uh, decided to go to college. My mother gave us an opportunity to go in the military because my cousins were all in the military. And I really didn't want to do that. So I enrolled at uh, Wichita University and was able to acquire a degree at that institution went to work for Boeing Aircraft Company. And Boeing Aircraft Company uh, employed me as an engineer. So I decided to, uh, when I wasn't working, to coach what they call Biddy League basketball. And this is how I transitioned into education because I had to go around to the elementary schools, predominantly black elementary schools, and talk to the kids about coming to the Salvation Army on Saturday mornings and play basketball. The age group was between eight, eight and 12. So uh, I started doing that, and I, I really enjoyed working with the young people, you know. And so uh, after a period of time, I put together a real nice team. Uh, we didn't make it quite to Puerto Rico, but we got close. And that's where the national championship was. So friends of mine who were principals and teachers in these schools, there were six predominantly black African-American schools, said, you have such a way with children, you ought to really think about being a teacher. Wow. And, uh, and I tell them, I say, hey, come on, you guys don't make any money, you know. So uh, during the course of the conversation, I talked to my uh, supervisor at Boeing and said, do you still have your leave of absence program? And they said, yeah, we still got it. I said, I'd like to apply for a year's leave of absence to teach school. And I said, before I do that, I have to get certificated to teach. And so I started going to school at night and got certificated to teach. Uh, Boeing gave me a year's leave of absence, and I started teaching at Ingalls Elementary School. And I, my first assignment was a sixth grade. And uh, I just learned so much from those children. And so what was interesting about it is going to uh, taking courses to be certificated it really didn't teach me how to teach the children. It taught me the methodology, but it didn't teach me the cultural things. And what I discovered was the only thing I had in common with the children in Wichita is we were the same color. My background was entirely different than theirs. And so uh, the next year, the second year, I reapplied for another leave of absence and Boeing told me, says, you gotta make up your mind on this one. Uh, what they did for me is they let me work during the summer when I wasn't teaching, so I could supplement my income that way. I was going to ask how that all worked out, because that seems like it's very not our culture today of trying out another profession and them still being happy with you working with them there. So. Yeah, I was one of eight people in this country who could, who could do what I could do for Boeing. And so they, they really valued me, and I learned a lot from them. What kind of work did you do for them? I was a, a, a packaging engineer. 
So it was during the Vietnam War and a lot of material, military materials need to be sent over there. So I designed containers and different things to ship those things out of the country to Vietnam. Some of them were uh, nuclear. I had a top secret clearance. And so it, it was good. Made a lot of money. It, it was good. You know, today we talk often, wouldn't it be nice to have a physicist? Wouldn't it be nice to have a chemist and people come back and teach? And I've met a few of those in my life before, but it's, it's not really the common career path for many folks coming back. So what did you love about it the most? Which, which aspect? About teaching, about teaching. Well, I think what was important to me was I realized the value of nuclear families, the value of having a parent, male and female, in the home the value of, of church, you know, established institutions, uh, the things that I took for granted, the children I work with didn't have those same opportunities. And I really tried to provide those to those kids. Uh, I, re I really enjoyed it. I learned, I learned a lot. I bet. I did. When we talk about kind of the payoff, I've, I've uh, cornered our dean before asking about the payoff, you know, of, of a teacher starting out. And sometimes there's that conflict of the home with parents sometimes even encouraging students, you know, we know you do good at teaching, but you could, do, you could do so much more, make more money doing something else. For you, obviously, you're probably making a better income at Boeing and then oh, going yeah. to teaching. No comparison. So was there any debate in your mind as to whether or not it was worth it? Making no, no. It, uh, teaching is not a money type uh, profession. You know, you have to like children. You have to see the importance of making an impact in their life. I, I call it teach, you know, it's the only profession where you touch the future. You really have no notion what these young people will turn out to be. And it's a very, very rewarding, at least it was for me. Excellent. Well, speaking of, of that timeline, as you began teaching for a while, at some point you got into administration and you moved on to uh, work with other school districts. Can you tell us a little bit about that transition of going from there and then eventually okay. coming out here to Kansas State University? Well. Um, my education career was one in which uh, Wichita embarked on what they called the, their desegregation plan in 1971. And so what I was interested in, and the national media was playing this up, you had the Boston situation, you had uh, the Keys case in, in Colorado, you had Houston, Texas. What happens to minority children when they're suddenly removed from their neighborhood and bust out to another neighborhood in which they have no knowledge about. I wanted to know what happened to them psychologically and socially. So uh, I enrolled in a graduate program and wrote a dissertation on that. And it was, it was very uh, interesting because what happened was uh, that there was no significant difference. And I, I summed that up meaning that the kids were like uh, immigrants or like pioneers because the programs were voluntary. So they'd volunteered to go to these other schools and ride these buses um, into sometimes a hostile environment, but they wanted to do it to get a better education. And for those who were unfamiliar with that whole um, desegregation, was that unique to Kansas that it was voluntary or was that nationwide? Nationwide. Nationwide. Yeah. During that period of time, uh, well, when I left public school teaching, I went to work for McCrell, Mid-Continent Regional Educational Lab. And I started doing work in desegregation all in the South, 18 Southern states. I was doing work for the Justice Department. And uh, I learned a lot. I didn't realize the difference between different aspects of the culture in the United States. I'm a Kansan, you know, and a lot of stuff my mother was very nervous about. She didn't want me going into the South because people had been injured down there. You mentioned in the documentary that your mother was very influential in your life and yeah. uh, some of the work that she did, reaching out to presidents and all kinds of things. What's, uh, what's one of the lessons you learned from your mom that maybe you didn't quite share or you didn't have time to share inside the documentary? Well, first, I couldn't figure out why I got in this kind of work because it started out as, you know, uh, just a kid growing up in southern Kansas. And what I discovered upon my mother's death is when we, I, I made her a cedar chest when I was in high school. And we opened up that cedar chest. There was a combination from FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. There were different letters. She was a writer for the Kansas City Call, which was a black newspaper out of Kansas City, uh, Missouri. And she'd write stories about what was happening in their race relations in Kansas. And they were published in this newspaper. 
And what I discovered is a lot of the things that I got into, she had done it before me, but she never talked about it. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the DNA in her body was planted in me. <laughs> you know? Very good, very good. Well, eventually you transitioned over here at Kansas State University and with that started the whole uh, Midwest Equity Assistance Center. Can you briefly tell us about what that center does and, and what your involvement's been these last few years? Well, uh, we, originally the, the center was at the University of Missouri Columbia from 1973 to 1978. And the charge of the, of the center was to assist school districts with the desegregation effort. And so for five years, right after I finished my dissertation, I was working in Columbia. And Columbia was basically one of the southern states that was cited in the uh, HEW case as uh, prejudice and all that kind of good stuff. And consequently, um, it was difficult doing that kind of work in Missouri because they were very resistant to it. They didn't want to do that, so I decided to ask the people at K-State, would they be interested in having this project on their campus? And at that particular point in time, they were very interested. Kansas was a free state, and the work was a whole lot easier. And so we moved it from Columbia to K-State, and it's been here 38 years. Wow, wow, and you've been here for? 38 <laughs> years. <laughs> That's excellent. That's excellent. Well, you know, when we had the premiere, uh, a lot of the folks that were there talking about um, your stories and things described you folks as kind of the elders of, of this university and the experiences you went through. You know, for a lot of folks, when we talk about race relations and, and the tensions that are even out here today, I've often heard you in the hallway saying these little comments about how we're, we're still kind of a baby in this country and we're still kind of in this learning process. What do you hope that teachers and uh, I, I will say this, what would you hope that teachers would share if they were to watch this documentary with their students? What would you hope that they bring out with their students or have a conversation about? Well, I think the thing that gets us in trouble in this country is that our common language is English. And the concept of English, when you hear different words mean different things to different people. And you can really see that across racial groups. Uh, I say that the, the wiring is different, that the brain hears information in English and they process it based upon their cultural experiences, their religious experiences, their family religion. And if they don't have the same experiences, they interpret the, the uh, situation differently. A, a good example of that is what my mother used to tell my father. She was carrying my sister and she'd tell daddy that her ankles were swollen and her, she couldn't hold any food down because so she was regurgitating the food. And he'd look at her, and my dad was about six foot two, and he'd look at her. My mother was five foot tall. He'd look at her and say, baby, I understand exactly what you're going through. And she'd almost ready to hit him because he did no more <laughs> understand what he was talking about than a man in the moon. I think we get into race, race relations the same way. Mm -hmm. And people hear things, they think it's the same way, and it's not. And so we got to get a common language and a common understanding of what we're trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. And until we can do that, it's going to be difficult. Yeah. This year for our university is kind of a year of uh, the theme of social justice. And so right. for many of our faculty, we're recognizing or trying to recognize through videos different aspects of their research, of their work, in which they are passionate about bringing about social justice. Could you go and define for us in your terms when you think of social justice today in education? What are the things that pop up to you? I, I think that what, what I strive for is just to be fair, to treat every child the same, black, white, green, or yellow. Mm -hmm. Just treat them fair. And recognize that those children who show up on Monday morning are coming there trying to be all they can be. And they're asking us in the educational venue to provide them the skills and the knowledge and the time to help them try to achieve the goals that they have. And, you know, it's not love. They don't need love. They don't need sandwiches. They don't need shoes. You know, they need just good, honest, consistent understanding. Is there anything else you'd like to pass on to our audience? If there's future teachers watching this and they're thinking about um, incorporating a long road or some of the things you've said today into their curriculum? As I said earlier, it's the only profession where you touch the future and the rewards are immeasurable. I think that, you know, you can look at these young people and see that 
they too want to make a contribution to this wonderful society we live in and try to do your part. Help them be all they can be. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, My pleasure. Great, great deal of, uh, it was a lot of fun to work on your piece in the, in the project. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. That was easy to, to work on, actually. So, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. My pleasure.